one. We're going to start in verse 35. Um, just a little introduction. Um, on the heels of John the Baptist, very familiar. If you, uh, you know, you've read anything, everyone knows the story of John the Baptist with the camel's hair and ate locusts, the crazy guy. And it says in verse, uh, if you want to open to John chapter 1, verse 32, I just want to go a couple verses before, just to give us a little background. Then John testified, I saw the Holy Spirit descending like a dove from heaven and resting upon him, speaking of Jesus. I didn't know he was the one, but when God sent me to baptize with water, he told me, the one whom you see the Spirit descend and rest on, is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I saw this happen to Jesus, so I testify that he is the chosen one of God. John was called, as you know, to set the, the, prepare the way for the Lord. And he had these expectations. He didn't know what to expect, how Jesus would come on the scene, or how things would look. In fact, he really didn't know until what? The, it was told that the Holy Spirit would come upon him, that you would know is the Savior. You know, have you ever put expectations on people and you think they should look a certain way or act a certain way? We do that. Whether it's our, 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 you know, on our pastor or our leaders or our wives, we set these expectations. A lot of times, a lot of us can't come to or attain or, or be like. And I can remember just the story to kind of go along this idea where we expect people to be a certain way or what they're going to look like. And we're not sure. It was a time when I was a, a kid and everyone watched the, the story of Top Gun, right? The, the movie Top Gun, if you remember my age. And there was a guy in there that was Iceman, right? His name was Val Kilmer in real life. And so I love that movie. He had the flat top. He was sharp looking or whatever. And then all of a sudden, in 1989, we were on a, a, a furlough uh, from the Philippines um, as, as missionaries, our family. And we came back and we went to see Pastor Rick and Marie and they said, let's, well, he was my uncle, and he says, let's go out to Lake Mead. And so we go to Lake Mead to have fun and all of a sudden we see all these trailers parked or whatever and my parents or my dad or somebody asked, what's going on? Well, they're shooting a movie called Kill Me Again, which was a movie you've never heard of unless you Google it, but it is a real movie that Val Kilmer was in. And so here I am, I don't remember how old I was, 11. Oh, I got to meet Val Kilmer. And there's my expectations of what he looked like or whatever were going to fit this, this mold. And so I, I can't remember, I was, I was young and then all of a sudden he comes walking up and it didn't look anything like Val Kilmer. In fact, someone had to tell me, that's him right there, one of the guys I was working over the set. He, his hair was down to here, he was smoking a cigarette and he was a little bit chubby. <laughs> Did it, he looked nothing with the flat top that you see an Iceman is the coolest guy, you know, in the movie. And I was like, and this is the only thing I said was, hi, uh, I think I said, hi, Mr. Val Kimber, I liked you in Top Gun. And that's all I said. <laughs> he goes, thanks, man. And all he said was, thanks, man, and he was on his way. Out of all the things I could have said, that's what I told him, was I liked you. So these expectations in, in not knowing what's, and then here Jesus comes onto the scene and the reason that John identified him was because of the Holy Spirit coming upon him and tells him, to, I saw this happen to Jesus, so I testify that he is the chosen one of God. He'd been prepared, God had told him what to expect, he didn't know, and then now here it happens. My example is kind of a cheesy one, but the reality is we do it a lot of times and we don't know. And even our pastor, we set these expectations upon people that we shouldn't do. We are human. Jesus is in a different category. But here's the story with John the Baptist telling people about the Messiah. He appears, and now we're going to see the ministry that unfolds. So verse 35, it says this. The following day, John was again standing with two of his disciples. You see, John had been telling the people about the Lord. And telling him, expecting. Well, guess what naturally comes when you begin to teach something that is of eternal value? People begin to follow. People want to know more. Sad to say, there are many people today that people are following that do not line up with eternal values, and they follow them, whether it's on Twitter or Facebook. So in these days, you would follow them physically. And so John the Baptist, more than likely the four characters you're going to see, were disciples of John the Baptist. 
They were followers of John. They had heard the story. They were expecting this Savior. And here he appears on the scene. And so he says the following day, in the chronologic order that he's talking about, was again standing with two of his disciples. They were waiting expectantly. In verse 36, it says this, as Jesus, verse 36, as Jesus walked by, John looked at him and declared, look, there is the Lamb of God. There is the Lamb of God. As Jesus walked by, here he is, or watching, as he walks by, he says, there is a Lamb of God. In the previous verses, in verse 29, he actually finishes the whole sentence. He says, look, the Lamb of God that does what? Takes away the sin of the world. Right away, in the Hebrew mind, you would understand what he's talking about. In fact, if you go all the way back to Genesis, you would know exactly what is talked about. The story of Adam and Eve. They did religiously try to cover their sin by doing what? Making their own coverings. But it wasn't enough, was it? They were trying to earn God's favor by making these uh, leaves and covering their nakedness because sin has been exposed and God does not recognize it. So what does he have to do? They have to cover themselves with tunics of, of, a, of an animal, it says. An innocent, blameless animal had to be killed and their skin would cover the shame of sin. Right there, back at the first few chapters of Genesis, we see the beautiful redemption plan of Jesus Christ moving forward. And we see the first example of religion and religiosity trying to earn God's favor by what we can do to make, to have His favor and God says, no, you can't earn my favor. I offer it in a free gift. And he provides an animal. And so as soon as he says, look, the Lamb of God, right away you would recognize. We don't really recognize that unless you've been in church. But if I was to go to high schools here and somebody that, that is watching the news and all their media is from Facebook and Twitter and all that, the, the young age, you say the Lamb of God, it would make no sense unless you have a, a background. Well, these people... John knew his audience. We have to know our audience. And we looked on past Monday, um, on, on Monday we did a, like a sharing your faith. And one of the things, you know, pointing out, you got to know your audience. And also you have to stay as much as possible on the main points that you want to get across. Because like most people, they want to cause rabbit trails. They want to talk of things that are not important. And they want answers to these crazy questions. We have to stay on task. We have to know our audience. And a part of knowing our audience also, they're either going to be emotional hearers or they could be intellectual hearers. And as you get to know somebody through relationship, you will know if they're an emotional hearer or they're intellectual. And as you know that, when you present the gospel in an intellectual way, you're going to go right to the Ten Commandments and really hit them hard. No, you are a sinner. You know, the good old boy syndrome. I don't, you know, and no, you've missed one, you've missed the mark. And then the emotional here is someone that says, yes, I'm a mess, I understand it. And so you have to know your audience. And so John says, look, the Lamb of God, they would immediately be recognizing that we go to the temple and we offer our sacrifices, these innocent animals, for the offering for our sin, to cover our sin because they understood they had a foundation. And so as Jesus walked by, John looked at me and declared, there is the Lamb of God. And look at verse 37. When John's two disciples heard this, they followed Jesus. They followed Jesus when they heard this. Now, I want to make it very clear. This is the way God has written his word, especially in the Gospels. They are very distinct. Matthew is not the same as Luke, as John, and Mark, and the way they wrote these four Gospels. John is the one that's way off in a total different. He only has a few miracles. He really hits on the I am statements. But the other three guys are more in line. And so what you, what you always want to do in Scripture, as you're studying, and my encouragement to you, is not to, to be able to look in your Bible, and it shows other chapters and verses, to correlate, to read together, to give you a bigger picture. 
If you read it, simply as it is, you would think that these guys didn't know anything absolutely about Jesus, that they just saw him, and then all of a sudden they followed. That's not really the case. As you read the other Gospels, in fact, um, in Luke, um, he talks about, in 5, at how they were fishermen, and how they were fishing on one side, and they knew everything. He says, well, cast your fish on, you know, your nets on the other side. You guys know that story. That goes along also with all this history. But John... His purpose was totally different, and he's more clear-cut in explaining other areas that the other guys may cover. And so my encouragement to you this morning, if you're not, you should be spending time in God's Word. And also, as you're spending time in God's Word, is read the different testimonies from different Gospels and see how they fit together. It'll open a whole new world in a perspective. Because just like you and me, we don't see the most important things that other people may see. What's important to me in a situation or event that happens may not be as important to you. Just like you've heard the example of an accident. Right? We are created totally different, and that's a good thing. And so he gives us this perspective of four distinct characters writing these Gospels that are a little different areas. But don't miss the main point. And when you're talking to people that want to confuse you or do it, always get back to the main point that it is all about what Jesus is doing and what he's going to do. Because each one of us have a testimony. And the testimony is really amazing. In fact, Bryce Hurt on um, Friday night was sharing his testimony, and he's got drugs and all the stuff he went through. A lot of us can relate to. But this woman that he married became a believer. Her parents, she didn't have any crazy stories. And for him, he wishes he could have been like her because all those things that he went through now affect him in his psyche and in situations that his brain you know, goes back to and struggles with rather than someone that grew up with this pure uh, lifestyle that didn't really have this amazing testimony. And people will say, oh, I don't have a great testimony like Raul Reese or... or um, Mike McIntosh and all these guys you read about in Ventures of Faith and so forth. That doesn't matter. God has given you your own story. But the main point has to be Jesus. It can't be about your story. Yeah, that's amazing. You want to share your testimony with people because they can relate. But the reality is about the person that has rescued you, drawn you from this life. And in this congregation here this morning, I've heard many of your testimonies, and that's amazing, and that's exciting. And so when John's two disciples heard what? Look, the Lamb of God, they followed Jesus. We have to send people to Jesus. They need us to point them to Jesus, not to Greg Laurie, not to Pastor Rick, not to myself. We have to point them to Jesus and what he can do. Yes, we can share our stories and show the amazing things or how the stupid things we still do and still wrestle. But the reality is we have to put the focus of people upon the Lord. He will use you or he may not use you. But we have an opportunity in people's lives. So when John's two disciples heard this, they followed Jesus. Notice that John did not say, where are you guys going? Why are you following Jesus? I'm baptizing people. I'm really popular. Look at all the disciples that have been following me for this time. No. It should not bother us when God calls other people or for what other ministries or, or God's calling them in different... We have to be all right to say, yes, follow Jesus. We don't want disciples of anyone. We want to be disciples of Jesus Christ. Now, God allows people in our, our church, our pastor, to teach things and learn and mentor, which we want to be as all elders here, and, and we're going to have a discipleship class. If you're interested in being disciple, one of us will you know, walk you through whatever curriculum or in, a, in, a, in a lifestyle and so forth. But we are simply doing what John the Baptist is doing. And we can't forget that. And so here, John the Baptist, the two disciples heard this, they followed Jesus. He didn't, it doesn't, he could care less. That's what his whole purpose was, was to point people. And so God calls you elsewhere to praise God, follow the Lord. 
not a person. Follow whatever he's laying on your heart. And look at the response in verse 38. Jesus looked around and saw them following. Now this is literally following and also figuratively. They were literally following him. You get the idea. Because look what it says. Jesus looked around. He was walking one way. They were following him. Right? They were following him as he was leading. And look at the question that he asks. What do you want or what do you desire? Depending on your translation. I'm a follower of the San Diego Chargers. I've been a disciple most of my life. I go to their games. I know there's a couple other people here. Well, guess what? I'm following them because my desire and the purpose long term is that they will go to the Super Bowl and they will win a championship and they will have a Super Bowl ring. <laughs> following someone always has a motive. Mine was the Chargers, and now they left San Diego, and now I don't have a team. I'm teamless. You got other. That's right. And so I got other choices that I can... But there's always a motive to following. You don't follow somebody unless you either know where they're going or there is a motive. These guys decided to follow Jesus. What are you following here this morning? What's motivating you to even be here this morning? What has drawn you to decide to come fellowship here this morning? Jesus is asking them, what do you want? That's kind of the title that I just thought like, as I was preparing to share. What do you want? He's asking them, and he asks everyone here this morning. What do you want? What do you seek? You guys are following me, Eternal. What do you want? Our, we're motivated, and our desires motivate our conduct. And following is not enough. They could have continued to follow, but what does Jesus turn around and ask them? What do you want? What is your motive? There's a deeper reason to why you're following me. What is that? So Jesus looked around, saw them falling. What do you want? He asked them. And they replied, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? As we're following and we're searching, there's the idea of wanting to investigate. As God puts people in your life, and maybe they do know the Lord, and maybe you were here this morning, it's because of a relationship. Someone had invited you. Or maybe you've been walking with the Lord for a long time. But he asks the same question. What do you want? If you are a believer, you know what you want. You want to glorify God in your life and whatever. And you want other people to enjoy this relationship that he's given you. And what's interesting is, is you know it's not an easy road. Following of Christ and being a follower of Christ. And that's why Jesus was very different than the way it's showed on television today in many teachings, is Jesus lays out really the bad news, how ugly it is to be a follower of Jesus Christ, but then he shows you the rewards. And there's a tendency now we want to show all the good things and tell people, well, this is what it's going to be roses, and the reality is it's not always true. And the example you always take people to, if they're asking or whatever, is the disciples. It was a hard road to be a follower of Jesus Christ. It was not an easy road. But Jesus always warned them, if you're going to follow me, you must deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow me. Unfamiliar, not famous teachings, but the truth that Jesus expressed to people that wanted to follow him in a real way. Narrow is the road to salvation. Broad. All these teachings are very... I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. No one could ever accuse Jesus of not presenting the truth. Even when the truth was not comfortable, even when the truth takes you out of your comfort zone and box, 
He presents the truth in a loving way because he explains to us that our time here is simply temporary. You're just passing through. And the older I get, I'm creeping up to that average age of 78 years old. And I say, Lord, I'm getting closer. What more do you have for me? I still feel like I'm young. But my wife's telling me I'm not. My children. <laughs> Jesus looked around, saw them. What do you want? He asked them. And that's the question that, you know, God's throwing out to you. What do you want if you're here? And you don't know the Lord. And he wants to spend this time with you. He wants you to get to know him even more. And so what does he do? The same thing. He says, where are you staying? Look at his response. Verse 39. Come and see. They're, he's following it along. He turns around, looks at them. He beholds them, and then he speaks to them. Where are you staying? Come and see discipleship come and see a disciple is a learner one who wants to learn and shows it by their conduct or their walk and not only that teaches it to others so a disciple is someone that follows the Lord wants to know more and it's kind of played out in their lifestyle now they're not perfect but they're disciples in fact a few months ago when I shared on discipleship kind of the same idea but one thing that's amazing about a disciple is once you learn this and you, you, you know, it's a part of your life, what do you want to do? You want to share it with others. Because you've experienced the joy of the Lord, even in the hardships, the trials, the, tr the struggles, the circumstances, or the good things that are going on in your life. And you want others to do what? Taste and see that the Lord is good. And so he invites them, come and see, come and investigate, come and learn more. And if you're here this morning, it's, it's really amazing that you're here and you're hearing on Sunday mornings. But getting involved is where you're going to learn even more. Getting involved is when you get to be around other people. As you're getting to know them and how much they love the Lord and how God's working in their life and you see they're just human people and so that's why when you go on a mission trip you see sides of people like wow that's our pastor and he used you know a certain word or you know he got angry or whatever they're real people but you grow together Jesus was hanging out with these guys all the time getting to know each other getting irritated with one another I've experienced that in our own, here in our church. How do I grow? Is by other people. Yeah, the Lord can show me a lot of things, but you know where I learn more is when I interact with people. We talk about God's word. I hear what the God's done in their life. And how does that line up with scripture? That is healthy. It is healthy to hang out with other brothers and sisters, to come and see what they're doing and be a part of to get involved with what they're doing in whatever serving capacity in the church, whether they're a missionary, whether you're a sender or you're a goer. That's how God interweaves our lives because he's relational. And so just like the master, I want to be the same way. When people ask, her, come and see, come check it out. I don't want you to come here or be around my life and make a decision right away. Don't base it on me. But I would like to think that as we interact as we, with one another, that we are forgiving, that we are loving and graceful. And when we do make mistakes, we apologize. Say, will you forgive me? That is totally out of character from the world. These are only things that God empowers you to do when you allow His Spirit and become born again. And so Jesus looked around, saw them. What do you want? He asked them. They replied, Rabbi, which means teacher or master or so forth. Where are you staying? They want to know, where is he staying? Come and see, he said. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon when they went with him to the place where he was staying. And they remained with him the rest of the day. From this day forward, as you guys know the story, their lives were flipped upside down. And he didn't draw them in. It doesn't say that he said, well, follow me and you're going to be wealthy. Follow me and your family is going to be healthy. He didn't use any gimmicks to have them follow him. In fact, the guys that they were disciples of was a guy that was out in the wilderness that everyone thought was loco. 
He was crazy. He was wearing, you know, camel's hair and chewing on lo uh, locusts and grasshoppers. That, that was, that's the guy that these guys were following. There had to be more than simply this physical realm. There was this spiritual. And so it was four o'clock in the afternoon and they remained with him the rest of the day. Verse 40. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of these men who heard what John said and then followed Jesus. And you guys all know the story of Peter, probably one of the most famous. Um, and you can get more story in other Gospels as you correlate. But he was also one of the first disciples, first of these four disciples that heard what John said and then followed Jesus. But remember, there was a background. God can just say, hey, know Jesus and follow it. That can happen, but these people had a foundation built. They knew a lot about the Old Testament. They had been hanging around. These, the, everyone, all the commentators believe that these guys were disciples of John the Baptist, which makes sense. God is very relational. And for me personally, there are people gifted at it, but I am not good at knocking at random strangers and giving them tracts and saying, here's the story of Jesus. I did it at Bible college. We went out on a Friday night. It was a great experience. But the reality is that's really not how people are going to come to know Jesus. The reality is, is when a friend or somebody invites them to hear God's word being taught at a church or whatever, or they're, they're watching a sermon online, but it's through relationships. And so even the idea of going to a coffee shop, which I shared with everyone on Monday night, and how to present the gospel in 20 minutes, it's a good tool to have in your belt, right? It's a good tool to have and understand. But most times... It's going to be because of a friend, a, a relative, that points you and says, hey, see this guy. I think he can help you in this area. Or they need prayer. That's how it develops, is through a relationship. And so here these disciples heard about him, heard about him, and now they see Jesus in person. And today, you can say, well, we don't have that luxury, Travis. Jesus is not living physically here on this earth. And I would say, you're right. But Jesus says, actually, we're better off because we have the Holy Spirit once we become a believer, right? But if you're a non-believer and you're not interested in God's word, more than likely, how is he going to reveal himself to you? Through everyone sitting here this morning. And that's why we always share, we want to be Christ-like. Not a Christian, we want to be Christ-like. Because when we are Christ-like in the way we live and act in our walk, as we're encouraged all throughout the scriptures, people, hopefully, as Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ, will see our lives. And they will want to know more about what Jesus has done because of us. But as people get to know you, they know that you're a real down-to-earth person. You're not going to be judging. You're going to be loving on them scripturally. And your foundation is the word of God. Andrew, Simon, Peter was one of these men who heard what John said and then followed Jesus. Andrew went to find who? His brother. Uh, went to find his brother Simon and told him, we have found the Messiah, which means the Christ. When God puts us on you, he becomes a what? A soul winner. And where does he want to reach out to first? His family. And you see it all throughout, even the disciples, a lot of these guys were related. They were family members. If you're here this morning, you're a part of the family of the Lord. Amen. Some of you are my brothers and sisters. Some of you are my grandpa and grandma, aunts and uncles, depending on the age range. But there's this relationship that happens because of the bond of Christ that is in us. And so he says, we have found the Messiah, which means the Christ. And look what it says. And Andrew brought Simon to meet Jesus. And look what it says in this version in verse uh, 42. Looking intently at Simon, Jesus said, Your name is Simon, son of John, but you will be called Cephas, which means Peter. Our names in our culture are way different than the Bible names. There was actually a part of your character. And God would do that a lot of times. He doesn't really change our names. Now we're, you know... We're, you know, followers of Christ. But in these days, when he would interact, whether it was Jacob's name being changed to Israel, or here, Simon being changed to Peter, has a lot to do with their character. Right? A rock, a stone. And you've heard many teachings on Peter. 
being a rock and so forth. But our character, the Lord sees right through you. I can't. None of us can. I don't know what's really going on in your hearts. I don't have that capability. But the Lord does. And so as we continue to, whether it's coming on Sunday mornings, as we come to worship the Lord, the Lord knows if our hearts are genuine or if they're off in a far distance. He sees and looks intently and he sees right through it all and he knows what you're really all about. That should scare you, <laughs> but it should also help you to not be fooling yourself thinking that you're fooling anyone else because that's the easiest thing to do is to fool many people. And that's why also as we encourage and as we fellowship is to be, have accountability, to be transparent with one another because the Lord sees our hearts and we need that. We need through this relationship of God speaking into our lives from other people. It's necessary. We need people watching out for us that love us, that are concerned where we're at that are willing to be led by the Spirit, not, because, not through our own desires to chop people down or use the Bible as a sword, but genuinely that there is a love that God lays in our heart, and it starts with our motive. So he looks intently at him, changes his name, and, and uh, just sees right through us. Verse 43. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee, up in the northern area. And he found Philip and said to him, Come follow me. Philip was from Bethsaida, Bethsaida, Andrew and Peter's hometown. So another guy, right, that he draws. And it wasn't like, just follow me. Once again, there was a background. He had known about him. Bethsaida is kind of cool. It's called the house of fishing. All these guys were fishermen. Just regular, average folks. In fact, on Friday night, Pastor Rick Neighbor kind of threw me in a, a group to do because one of the guys wasn't there. I'm like, oh, sure, sure. So we had this group of 10 high schoolers. And there's this mindset, and it may be your mindset here this morning, that to be used of God, to be a missionary, you have to go to Bible college, you have to be someone that is going to go out to church plant, and that's really the main thing. Well, as you know, our missionaries that went are more in the medical field. And so I wanted to explain to these young kids at this young age that God can use you even with your vocational training. The whole time we were in Belize, and even right now, we're looking for someone to help the school with this hydroponic tilapia farm. Now, how many people go to college, in Bible college, to be a mechanic to serve the Lord on the mission field, or to be a hydronic, you know, tilapia farm fisherman, or electrician to use your gifts? We don't think that way. But living on the other side of the spectrum, those guys are more valuable than someone that could come here and teach the Bible and think they got it all figured out. <laughs> oh, and even down there, oh, here's another person wanting to start a church. We got enough churches. We need practical ways. We need strong, healthy churches. And so I shared with them, if God's even in the medical field and you want to be a nurse, continue to do your schooling. I said, what I don't want you to go home on your parents on Monday, which has happened in our church because someone got excited, is to go home and say, oh, I'm ready to sell everything and go to you know, Belize or, or wherever as soon as I graduate high school. That is cool that God's stirring you, but be patient. Finish where God has you through high school and whatever you know, God can direct you in college or so forth, but be open to what God's doing. And so I encourage them, you're at this mountaintop experience and you feel God's going to call you to all these ends of the earth, that's exciting, but also recognize, take notes at a year or two from now and continue to pray about it. And that's the same thing to hear this morning. You have different gifts. God may be calling you to use you like these fishermen, simple fishermen that would change the world. And the reason why most of us are sitting here is because of what these apostles did through their ministry that has reached us today. So um, Philip was from Bethsaida, Andrew and Peter's hometown. And Philip went to look for Nathaniel. So once again, it's like wildfire. God's doing a work in your heart. He's exciting. You want to do what? You want to tell everybody. All right? We want to tell everyone. We're excited. This is a life-changing event. Especially for them. Here's the, the Savior. Well, it's the same thing for you. Think back to when you became born again and you surrendered your life to Christ. I like to think that was very exciting. 
I would like to think that you were excited, and not only that, you're, wherever church you were at, they wanted to baptize you, so now you can tell the world that I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. Baptism is not getting me into heaven. It's simply showing the world that I'm dead to my sin when I go in the water, and now I'm in newness of life. It's not for the Lord to see. It's for you as your testimony to the people in your lives. That's why it's important. And we're going to have a baptism in a couple months on Easter Sunday. So begin praying about that. If you've been coming here for an amount of time or you want to know more, Lord, talk to one of us. We'll explain more what baptism is. If you want to be discipled, see one of us. We'd love to help you in your walk. We have to offer that. Just like Jesus said, come and see. We're saying you come and see what the Lord's doing. And so Philip went to look for Nathanael and told him, we have found the, the very person Moses and the prophets wrote about. Once again, these guys had a grounding, a foundation of the Old Testament. They knew that Moses and the prophets were talking about this person that would one day come, and they have found him. That's why we study the Old Testament. I was just talking to someone this morning that we, we were looking at a couple of verses in Genesis chapter 2, but now he wants to read all of Genesis. And I say, do it. Genesis is, well, it's the beginnings. <laughs> More is to say, everything is built upon Genesis from the history of the earth to even salvation and redemption all the way back to the first few chapters. Yes, read the Gospels, but you know what they're going to end up doing? Pointing you back to having to search the Old Testament. And whether it's an exodus we're doing on Wednesday night, you've got to have a good understanding of the scriptures as a whole, the full counsel of God, as Paul would ex encourage people in Acts and so forth. And so look at his response in Jesus, the son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nazareth, not a very common place. And look at his response, verse 46. Nazareth, <laughs> exclaimed Nathaniel, can anything good come from Nazareth? And look what he says, come and see for yourself. Here now, there's an opportunity to meet someone that in the past wasn't like, okay, I'll believe and follow. This guy has some questions. What? Nazareth? Can anything good come out of this little town of Nazareth? And think of your own Nazareth that you're thinking, a little town out in the middle of nowhere that, you know, it's known for hoodlums or riffraff or whatever. Think of that, whoever it is right now, whatever town. The Savior of the world is going to grow up and come out of Nazareth? You're going to meet people like this, by the way. You're going to meet people as you interact in your lives that simply will not believe God's word. Not, even, not just this story, but believe that God would come in the flesh to this creation. Get real. And this whole story about a, a guy named Jesus dying, that he rose from the dead, and anything can be, there's no such thing. You're going to meet people like that. And your response is, you present it, you say, well, that's what the Bible teaches. That's who I put my faith in. And then you just let it go. And you have opportunity to pray for a person. But don't try to get an argument or whatever. You present it. And look what he did. He presents it. And this Nathaniel had a few questions. Can anything good come from Nazareth? Come and see for yourself, Philip replied. And as they approached Jesus... Look at Jesus' response. And I like this translation of the New Living Trend. Now here is a genuine son of Israel, a man of complete integrity. So different in New King James Version. A genuine son of Israel. Jesus has the ability to see right through the heart. And even though Nathaniel couldn't believe or whatever, as soon as Jesus sees him, he says, here is a genuine son of Israel. Right? A genuine son of Israel. Who was the first man that basically was changed name to Israel? Jacob. He was not a very good character. We learned a lot from him, but as we're going to see, he was full of deceit, or guile, which you'll read in other translations. But this guy, Nathaniel, in the New Testament, that's a new first disciple of Jesus, he was what? A genuine son of Israel. A man of complete integrity. I don't like the word integrity. Because if really, ultimately, you want to know the word integrity, is what you're like when nobody's around. And for men, that is a difficult thing. And I'm sure women too. But that will hit you to the core. 
especially as men, that what you're like when nobody's around, who convicts your heart? Are we walking by the Spirit? But this man was a man of what? Integrity. The word integrity, what you like when nobody else is around, and could you get away with it? Could you steal it and absolutely anybody would know? Could you do this deed or whatever nobody would know? A man with integrity, it doesn't matter because they know the Lord is watching, which you're going to see in the next verse. There's no hiding from the Lord. Ooh, those should scare you. They scare me sometimes. But then I also think of the graciousness of the Lord. And he pours out his grace. And so it says, Now here is a genuine son of Israel, a man of complete integrity. And look what his response is. How do you know about me? And Nathaniel asked. How do you know about me? How do you know uh, I'm this kind of person? I've never met you. My whole life. And look at Jesus' response. Jesus replied, I can see you under the fig tree before Philip found you. Notice the fig tree, symbol of Israel, and just another one of someone that's under this covering of Israel. Right? Covering of Israel. He was under the fig tree, and who sees him? Jesus. Here he is by himself in this solitary place. Nobody's around, as far as he knows. It goes also back to the story with Jacob, where he was in a solitary place where he has this dream, which we're going to see. A lot of correlations between these two, these two men that, that John chooses to put in these texts, which are powerful. And so, here he is, and Jesus knows that I could see you under the fig tree before Philip found you. And then look what his response is. He exclaimed, Rabbi, you are the Son of God, King of Israel. That's all he needed to hear. Nobody was around me that day. I've never seen him or whatever. I was really in this time with the Lord under this fig tree. By the way, it's a good thing to have times where we kind of get away. Spend some time out in nature, in creation. Get away from the hustle and bustle of life and spend quiet time and, and solitary time. In fact, for me, when I'm going into Belize, you know, I get up early and for whatever reason, it's noisy in the morning, so I'd go up to school and just walk around. Nobody was around. It was really nice. And especially down there, creation is just like speaking out. How can you live in this world and not look around and be like, there's got to be a designer. <laughs> there has to be a designer. I mean, creation just tells you the way, Nate, everything. There has to be a designer. How people can say that just happened is beyond me, and you have to choose, and we know all the scriptures. But man, you see this amazing place, and it's just, it's that time where you're solitary. You need that. I encourage you to do that. Get away from the hustle and bustle. Tell your wife you're going to go out wherever for a couple hours and just spend some quiet time. And meet with the Lord there. And so here he was, and Jesus knew, and that's all he needed to hear. You are the Son of God, King of Israel. And that statement, Son of God, is kind of a new statement. It wasn't really, you didn't hear in the Old Testament, but Son of God goes back to this idea, which a lot of people don't want to believe, that God would come in the flesh and dwell amongst his people, which you read in John chapter 1, is here in the flesh. And man, if you can latch on to that this morning, because of God's Spirit, that is powerful, and that is what everyone else in the world wants to tear apart, that Jesus was just a bit under God. And that's what, if, if, if Satan can convince people that Jesus really wasn't God, he was just a little under, I've won it. And there's so many people that will not recognize that God in the flesh, that in the beginning God was a triune being, even before creation, the God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And Satan wants to just cause commotion in that area and deny that Jesus was God in the flesh, as you read in 1 John, and that is the spirit of the Antichrist. Those that deny who Jesus was, that God would send his Son to provide a way for this creation. And that is the major point that divides those that follow the Scripture and those that want to stray off from truth. And that's a whole other thing that spent a lot of time we could talk about. And finally, last two verses. 
Then Jesus asked him, Do you believe this just because I told you I had seen you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than this. This is just the beginning, Nathaniel. If you think this is amazing, wait until you see the amazing things that I'm going to do and the things that you're going to witness, Nathaniel. The miracles, the healing, the teaching, the floodgates of everything from the Old Testament is going to be revealed through my life and moving forward in history. So stay tuned. Be ready. And then I love this last verse, which ties in once again back to that Old Testament with Jacob, which his name was changed to Israel, and this vision that he saw, and he goes right back to it. God always fulfills his word. No matter if you see it in the Old Testament, and we've seen all these prophecies that have been fulfilled to the T, why would he not continue to fulfill his prophecies? And we're in an amazing time in history, in this, this time between the last week that God has placed us in this church age to continue to reach the lost. And when I say lost, I mean the lost in every country, including Israel. Because Israel, too, is a mission field, just like Mesquite. Wherever God calls you. So it's an amazing thing. And look what he says in verse 51. We'll close with this verse. Then he said, I tell you the truth. You will all see heaven open and the angels of God going up and down on the Son of Man, the one, I love this translation, who is the stairway between heaven and earth. Not the Led Zeppelin song. <laughs> There's only one stairway, folks. You want to cause people in their thinking of all worlds, all religions lead to heaven and every road is fine. You just simply read John 14, 6 and right away they'll become your, not enemy, but they are not going to be comfortable around you anymore when Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. That will offend not 80% of our country and most places around the world just by reading that. And so their thoughts that Jesus was a good teacher, a good prophet, which they all believe that, right away when you read that, they say, oh, he said that? Yes. But it's good to challenge the thinking of people and always base it on the scripture. But this interesting story goes back to the story in Genesis, uh, I think 28, 12. We're not going to turn to it. Yeah, 28, 12 where Jacob has this dream and he sees this. And this stairway has opened for you and I. And from this point on, as I shared, now Nathaniel is going to see everything fulfilled from the Old Testament flowing through in person by the actions and the words of Jesus Christ and how he's going to interact for the next three and a half years. This was just the beginning these guys are going to learn so much more and God's going to change them so much in three years and for the rest of their lives, we need to have the same mindset. If you are a new believer here this morning and you don't understand it all and when Pastor Rick shares the end times and, and you're, you're confused or whatever, that's okay. You are going to continue to grow. You need to get involved as you're following Christ and interact with other people. Different opportunities throughout the week. That's how you're going to grow. What do you want if you are content and all you want is to come here on Sunday mornings and to be petted and make you feel good and hear these amazing sermons and hear some great worship only on Sundays and you're okay with that? Then I pray that God would take you even deeper that he would reveal to you, yes, I am your Lord and I'm your Savior and I want to walk with you and have you follow me and for you to come and see and invite and investigate and to become more like me. No, not so you, I can send you from Calvary Mesquite in two years to be a missionary. No, so you can be the one up here presenting the teacher, teacher uh, the teaching, right? 
not so you can do all that, but I have a specific work for you, and you don't even know what it is, you just come and see. That's what the Lord's saying to all of us here this morning. And so we build from this. This is just the beginning on Sunday mornings. We have a broad audience here. As I'm teaching here this morning, this is going to apply to someone way different than somebody else. And God had a broad audience. Jesus had an audience from all different backgrounds. And he's the one that's going to work on your heart this morning. My job is just try to make it practical, throw in a few stories that I can relate to. But I believe, and I know that God is the one that's going to work in your heart this morning. Not by anything that I could say to manipulate you. God has plenty of words to hit you way harder than I can hit you. And that's a good thing. But I also believe that God uses us as brothers and sisters. And as we see the scriptures, as we fellowship together, that there is growth. And we don't have a physical Jesus to follow around here on this earth. No, but we have tons of followers and disciples. So find the person. Find people in your life that you want to grow together with. Find times to find solitary places with the Lord. That he can speak to you and show you this ladder that he maybe wants to pour out through your life. That's what he wants. And so let's close a word of prayer. Um, Tom's going to come up and close with a song. And I know it was a lot of verses. I apologize for that. But they're very easy verses to read. And so as you go home today, as you read in your, your private time, in the mornings or during the week, read over these verses. There's so many points. I didn't even use my notes. I, I had a lot of cool things I'd like to have shared, but I never looked down. And that's okay. Because I believe the Lord's the one that's going to draw you unto himself. It's not going to be anything that I have to say or anyone else. Go before the Lord as you leave here this morning and say, and ask him, what do you want? And as he asks you that, you can respond. Lord, thanks.